All right, well, why don't we go ahead and start? I'm sure everybody will get here. We're going to meditate a little bit anyway to start class. So, um, so I'm going to do something that we always do at the Sacred Stream, which is to open circle. And that means I'm going to say a phrase, and you can say it after me. And then um, we'll go ahead and have everyone introduce themselves. And then I will talk about spiritual emergency and Buddhist practice. So um, the sun is a circle. The sun is a circle. The moon is a circle. The moon is a circle. The earth is a circle. The earth is a circle. The drum is a circle. The drum is a circle. We are a circle within a circle. We are a circle within a circle. All right. Well, welcome everyone. So happy. This is a collective, and I so appreciate everything you all do to bring the Dharma across the now across the world, not just across the mission. And um, thank you for inviting me back. And my name is Isa Gucciardi, and I'm the founder and lead instructor at the foundation of the Sacred Stream, which is a school for consciousness studies in Berkeley, California, and now across the world with the internet as well. And um, um, I, um, I'll talk more about my, my Buddhist background a little bit so you know who and who's talking to you and why. But first, I'd like to learn a little bit about each of you and just find out you know, what your name is, where you're calling from, and what brought you here, and if there's any particular thing you'd like me to focus on, okay? So, um, actually, um, Noam, do you mind uh, calling on people and um, have and starting with yourself, and then and then you can have everyone introduce themselves. Happy to do that. Um, thank, thank you. you. Um, my name is Noam. I'm uh, one of the volunteer board members at the San Francisco Dharma Collective. I'm happy to see some new faces and lots of familiar faces. And um, I just, the topic just seemed incredibly relevant to me, spiritual emergency. I mean, I can name things that happened to me this week, but it's almost like everything's a spiritual emergency right now. So <laughs> not even that. So yes, I'm just very happy to be here. And um uh, let's um, hear from Ken, please. And you should be able to unmute yourselves. Uh, you may be muted. There we go. I had to wait to receive the command. When I clicked on the button, it said, "You, you the host can only the host can unmute you." And I was like, "Okay." So anyway, um, hi, Isa. Um, she recognizes my voice. I've been a student of hers at the Sacred Stream for uh, a few months now, and um, used to be a uh, San Francisco Bay Area resident for ten years before I went off to Tokyo for six years, and now I've been up here outside. Uh, Seattle for 16 years living with my family. So um, yeah, I'm happy to be here. And um, the, the topic of spiritual emergency felt relevant. And uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right, and Alejandra. Hi, Isa. Hi, everyone. I'm Alejandra Siroca. And uh, I, I think that we are living in a time of a spiritual emergency yeah. in the whole world. So I'm interested in the topic, and um, I'm glad to see you again. Thank you. Glad to keep you here with all of you. Thank you. Thanks, Alejandra. And um, Ellen. Hi, hello everyone. Um, hi, Isa. And I'm a student of Isa's um, just this last month and ongoing. I'm so excited. Um, this topic looked, I mean, couldn't 
find it interesting. Um, so I'm here and all ears, all heart. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. Um, how about Kara? Hi, Issa. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Kara. I am in San Francisco. I'm very pleased to be here. I'm a therapist, and I'm very excited to learn more about spiritual emergencies from a clinical perspective and also a Buddhist perspective. And as somebody who identifies as having gone through some spiritual emergency passages myself, I'm very excited for the content tonight. So thank you so much for having me and hosting this. Thank you. Thanks, Kara. Um, Daniel. Hey everybody, my name is Daniel. I'm in San Francisco. I work as a teacher. I'm here because Noam invited me and I trust him. So I'll pretty much go to anything he invites me to if I can. Um, and I'm here also just because um, I'm also a student and just in my work life and in my student life, I'm seeing a lot of people in survival mode and I need to be in spaces where people are not just in survival mode, but we're like actually talking about what's really going on, but in a way that is healing. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jenny Dahl. Hi, I'm Jenny. I am in San Francisco. I'm super excited to practice with you again. Um, it's the right time, right space, right here, right now. <laughs> that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Mary? Hello, Isa. Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be here and be with you all in circle. Um, I'm from the Gold Coast in Australia, and I already do studies with Isa. Um, I have done studies in spiritual emergency before. Um, the book by the Groffs, The Stormy Search yeah. Itself, was what we used. Um, so I'm really keen to see what Isa has to add to that. <laughs> Thank hard, you. A, hard act to follow. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and I relate to everything everyone just said. <laughs> totally. All right. Thank you, Mary. And uh, Mace and Pamela. Hi, everyone. I'm Pamela. And I live in San Francisco. And I just always find it really nice to take teachings from Isa. They continue to support me in thriving as a human. And um, I, I'm, I'm really glad that you're able to come to us through the Dharma Collective angle. And I'm looking forward to receiving and sharing your teachings. And I'm Mace. Um, I'm also in San Francisco. Wouldn't it be funny if I wasn't? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but with Issa, that might be possible. But not. <laughs> so, um, and just uh, love taking teachings also from Issa and love the Dharma Collective. And Issa, I was supposed to do an introduction of you. And so um, what I'll say, I think everybody um, seems very familiar with Issa, but um, Issa is a fierce, fiercely compassionate, wise, and soft and tender human being. And I've had just so much grace to be able to sit with her and learn from her and um, she's also written some wonderful books and spearheaded a beautiful therapeutic practice um, called depth hypnosis and she has this and the sacred stream in Berkeley and their range of offerings is um, really quite extraordinary and I recommend that people check that stuff out um, and there's sort of something for everybody there actually it feels like and um, so we're just we're so happy that you're here and um isa started this series out the wise action series um was i think the first teacher and so it's just really exciting that you're back and um i wish that i could say that we don't need the series anymore but that just seems like we're gonna need it for a long time to come so happy that you're here 
Um, thank you for having me. Uh, you know, uh, Mace, you're the one who invited me first to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, okay, so is everyone, everyone has, uh, I, again, I'm not really looking at the camera. I mean, I'm not looking at the screen. I'm looking at a camera. So I just want to make sure everyone was able to introduce themselves. Actually, I, I just dropped in. Oh, oh great. Yeah, Isa, and, uh, Matt just came in. So wonderful. And Matt, we're just sharing where we are and who we are and if there's anything particular that we want to say about what brought us to this why we're interested in this topic and that anything particular we'd like Isa to touch on thank you no uh yeah. yeah i'm my name is matt i am in san francisco uh and uh, uh and the reason i was interested in in this uh wise action is because uh um, I've noticed myself and my friends are all uh, struggling with, you know, wanting to affect uh, positive change, but feeling like we're standing at the beach and a tsunami is coming in and we're just holding our hands out, you know, and going to stop the wave. And it's just like, you think this is going to work? Uh, you know? <laughs> so, um, so I've been doing little things and, uh, and I've been finding that's been helpful to me, but, um, uh, but to be perfectly honest, you know, I think about pre-Nazi Germany and like if the people would have gone on the streets with bats and knives and guns, maybe they could have stopped that mess. Um, and so that's where the edge, where I lead to in the darkness. And I'm pretty sure that's not the way to do it. Um, <laughs> so I'm looking, toward, I'm looking for some more light in my direction, I suppose, is what I'm doing. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Um, Isa, there's another person who just joined us. So oh, great. I'm going to ask her to introduce herself. Ellen, sorry, I know you had trouble finding the Zoom link, but um, we're glad you're here. And if you would introduce yourself. And um, OK, she's keeping her video on mute. She says she's from the San Francisco Bay Area, has been to many of Isa's trainings and love them, had a rough meditation retreat in her 20s where she was overwhelmed and it affected her heart chakra area. Interested in structured way to help herself and others heal from overwhelm. Okay. Thank okay. You. All right. Thank you so much, Noam, for your your facilitation. I really appreciate it. Um, okay. So um, you know that with that uh, very. Thank you for that generous introduction, Mace. I really appreciate it. Um, so you know who I am, and um, so just to, so it seems, you know, I'm really glad that I asked everyone to say what brought you here, because it seems like people really are in kind of a spiritual emergency right here, right now, and in general, or that you know people that are close to you who are, and I think that is um, the nature of these times, and um, I, I, um, I want to talk about spiritual emergency within the context of Buddhist practice. And I think what I'll do is I may cut my, my, um, I may cut my talk a little bit short so that I can help you address if you have something that's really up that I, can, I could offer you a thought. What I'm going to do is I'm going to present uh, three different types of spiritual emergencies. And um, then I'm going to talk about how they were addressed within the context of depth hypnosis, which is a spiritual counseling practice that I developed that draws heavily on Buddhist practice. I've been a Buddhist practitioner for probably 45, almost 50 years now. And um, um, Buddhism is very, very close to my heart. And... Um, I studied with Zen teachers at the beginning, and, and then I kind of found my home in, in Tibetan Buddhism. And uh, depth hypnosis is um, a process of understanding that uses D Buddhist principles extensively, especially, for instance, the Four Noble Truths, and as a diagnostic tool, for instance, to help people understand 
you know, how they're creating their suffering through their attachments and their aversions and their misconceptions. And that fierce compassion that Mace was talking about is something that is very important to depth hypnosis processes. It's a it, fierce compassion, of course, is different than, say, idiot compassion, which um, fierce compassion is naturally a, a totally compassionate holding of all phenomenon. But then there's this this un, unflinching um, uh, process of helping a person understand how they're creating their suffering. And of course, you do that only with permission when you're in the clinical setting. You don't go down on the street telling people, hey, this is what's going on. Um, but you know, you, you ask questions around the places within a fiercely compassionate way around the places where they're attached or they're, or they're um, aversive or have a core belief that's off. And then, of course, um, within depth hypnosis, there's a, a understanding about the nature of karma and karmic conditioning. And we actually, what depth hypnosis actually is, is a process of dissolving karmic patterns. And we do that, uh, you know, the, the Buddhist framework is right there, but we do that dissolution of the resolving the karmic patterns by combining shamanic practices and energy medicine practices and hypnotherapy practices with understandings from transpersonal psychology as well as applied Buddhist psychology. So I'm going to be speaking a little bit clinically because that's where I have my, you know, that's where I have my experience. Um, but I, um, I, I, I want to, um, also try to acknowledge and be present for what everyone else is experiencing in just ordinary reality. I think we're all <laughs> sort of like walking. I think life is like a walking therapy session at this point. Everything is so intense, you know, right? And one of the last aspects, I mean, there are massive, massive number of aspects that we work with from Buddhism and, and in depth hypnosis, but one of the very important ones is personal responsibility. And, you know, I think all of us are struggling to understand what is it, you know, how do I take responsibility not only for my own situation, but how do I, how do I try to affect the environment when there is so much loss of understanding about what it is to be responsible for oneself among many of us, uh, many of those around us. So um, this is something we'll be focusing on. But I thought before we, um, you know, take a look at these three types of spiritual emergencies and, and I demonstrate how we work with those emergencies um, with Buddhist practice within the context of depth hypnosis, I thought it might be an idea to just have a little bit of time to focus inward with meditation, just a short time just to help us kind of a clear um, internal space and so I'll just walk you in um, just letting yourself get settled feeling your back straight if you're sitting on a chair with your feet on the ground or if you're sitting on the floor with your legs crossed your hands in your lap. And as you feel the surface supporting you, under you, just beginning to notice where your breath is. Noticing as you breathe in where your breath goes, and noticing as you breathe out where your breath goes. And if any other thoughts should come into your mind, just let them pass through like clouds passing through the sky and then return to your breath. Just 
focusing only on your breath. And I won't be doing any talking for a little while as you focus on your breath. Just remember, the past is gone forever. The future is not yet here. All you have is the present moment and your breath. And just allowing yourself now, if you've been breathing through your mouth, to breathe through your nose. And if you've been breathing through your nose, you can breathe through your mouth. And just feeling the surface under you again. And just following your breath back out into the room. You may want to stretch a bit as you open your eyes. So a little bit of shamatha meditation. That was, I know many, many of you already have a shamatha practice. But for those of you that are new to meditation, there's several different types of meditation within Buddhist practice. And that the one we just did is called shamatha, which means calm abiding or quiescence. And the idea is to have a one-pointed focus so that you can, and here we were using the breath, so then you can kind of let the, all of the kind of noise from you know, the stress and the anxiety of what it is to live these days to just kind of settle so that you can kind of create an internal space with your breath that is free from sort of the, the noise of the current time. So, 
And this practice is really important to do right now uh, because the, you know, the, the main thing about what's happening right now, one of the reasons why so many people are feeling that they're in a spiritual crisis, in a spiritual emergency, is because of the way in which time and space is being altered. And um, if you can have a stable connection to time and space within you, then all of the wobbling that's happening uh, because of all of the disrupted schedules and all of the um, inability to create things in the, you know, in the places where you thought you were going to create them, um, becomes less jarring. And um, that, you know, that inability to, to be able to maintain or the way in which the world around us is not really maintaining stability very well. It's very important to have that internal space and to have a definite daily practice where you're doing that meditation at least five minutes a day. It'd be great to do it for 20, great to do it for an hour. Um, but um, that, for those of you that are really feeling the stress of uh, the crisis around us, I, I can't recommend anything more than shamatha. This is really a helpful antidote. And you're going to see how we work with time and space, uh, you know, helping people work with uh, adjust and integrate spiritual crisis and spiritual emergency um, with time and space through Buddhist practice as I go through these different um, examples that I have from, for you that are drawn actually from my clinical practice. <clears throat> I've been working with spiritual emergency for 25 years. Um, it's one of the things that I have specialized in over the years. And um, so I'm going to draw these case studies uh, from that. And just to kind of go over again what a spiritual emergency is, it occurs, this is an event that occurs when someone becomes overwhelmed. I mean, the technical term, but I think we're all, I mean, we're all having different varieties of spiritual emergency right now, but the technical, technical term is when someone becomes overwhelmed by an encounter with a transcendent experience. These encounters can occur in different types of circumstances. They can occur in an unbidden way, or they can be a result of a spiritual, psychological, or emotional exploration. And people can respond to these encounters in a variety of ways, from a state of collapse to a state of acceleration and everywhere in between. So in this talk, we will explore the phenomenon and learn how to recognize it. And we will look at how various Buddhist practices can help bring balance for people who are trying to integrate this experience of the overwhelm of, with the transcendent, both within themselves and with those around them. So that's the that was the uh, description that you that that you read about coming in, and I think I think it's worth repeating. So I'm going to talk about um, three different. Uh, I'm going to give you three different examples of three different types of spiritual emergencies, and I'm going to provide a case study, um, and then uh, the solution that we came to within the depth hypnosis environment using Buddhist tools. And um, the first uh, spiritual emergency case I'm going to be uh, talking about is one that was encountered within Buddhist practice. And um, the second one I'm going to be talking about is one that was encountered um, as a result of um, uh, a plant medicine experience. And the third one is um, an example of a resurgence of unaddressed trauma. And this can occur within one's own spiritual practice, and it can occur just walking down the street. And I think that's the one that's really happening a lot right now, where people's unaddressed previous traumas are really getting triggered, and um, at, by all of the by all of the uh, sense of being, you know, under pressure, and um, and. There, you know, there's a definite way to help work with that. So we're going to look at that. So um, let's look at this first case study. Um, well, well, let's look at the definition of the first one. So let's look at a type of spiritual emergency that can emerge 
as a result of one's own spiritual practice. And um, I think that one of the more, so these kinds of, the, the things that can generate this, um, in particular, the, the most common pathway for this that I've seen is when people are chasing the non-dual experience in their spiritual practice. They've, they've kind of developed an attachment to the non-dual experience. And um, they have mistaken concepts about the non-dual state. And so let's define the non-dual state because people throw that word around a lot, non-duality. Um, it's, it's where the, the, the border between subject and, op and object disappears, where, you, um, where, where opposites uh, emerge, merge into one another. It's, um, it's a place where definitions are um, uh, kind of the, the definitions and boundaries between things are blurred. And the reason that people chase this non-dual state is because they, you know, there's lots of stories and, you know, lots of anecdotal evidence about um, people who attain a certain level of meditative focus, like we just did today, um, and um, a certain level of realization and understanding uh, of, the, of the texts um, of whatever, we, you, you know, here I'm speaking from a Buddhist perspective, and we're in a Buddhist environment here, but it could be also other, other um, particularly Hindu or Vedic, or yogic based kinds of uh, practices that would be similar to this where the 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 pursuit of the non-dual state is is considered to be sort of the penultimate attainment of one's spiritual realization and so you know one of the things that people try to do i mean the the non-dual state is characterized by of course this compassionate expansive holding of you know the sense of connection to everything this lack of division between within oneself and and within others that's mediated by compassion and generosity and joy and loving kindness and um, you know this sort of you know sense of being able to embrace everything that is without any kind of conflict. So um, of course that's a place we'd all love to be, right? Um, but it takes some work to get there, and um, uh, and of course, so you know, there's always that possibility of having this, you know, moment of like, boom, there it is. You see the non-dual state, but that only happens after a lot of work. You wouldn't recognize it. I know there's always this, this little diversion here. There's always this big discussion. You know, can, you know, can enlightenment come in an instant? Yeah, yeah, I can. I think, but after a long, a lot of instance of hard work and resolving internal obstacles that would prevent you from being able to merge into that non-dual awareness. And um, this is what happens. It, people forget that there's some work to do and they simply want to try to hold, you know, compassion and loving kindness and, and and joy is what's wonderful. It's a wonderful practice. But if you try to just lay that on top of unaddressed issues such as anger or resentment or the desire for revenge or hatred or self-hatred, you know, these, these issues that can be addressed in Buddhist practice through devotional practices but with, um, and, and meditative focus, um, but often require, you know, a, a, you know, a little bit more incisive therapeutic intervention because all of us struggle with these difficult emotions and, um, and there is a, a way to address them in a, in a more catalytic way than simply trying to suppress them and lay a non or conception of a non-dual state over them and um, I always say in the depth hypnosis classes you can't let go of the self until you heal the self and I think there's always this desire to let go of the self to get into the spiritual place you know and 
and it's um, you know you know the path into that non-dual state is through the self not getting away from the self and I think a lot of people have that misconception and um, that they have to get away from themselves in order to be you know be enlightened and so people are trying you know so 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 what people try to do is they try to disown their experience oh if I'm a spiritual person I can't be angry I saw this happen I, saw, I felt so sorry for this person I'll give you an example I was at this retreat center teaching I was co-teaching a class with them um, it was a class on Buddhism and um, and so it was a big hall there's a lot of people there and um, this dog came in to the hall and peed in someone's purse during the class and I was appalled you know I thought this you know the dog's not supposed to be in here for one thing and then they peed in this the dogs peed in the purse and I'm like I'm going to the organizers and I'm saying like you know this isn't okay you know we have to make this right for this person and um, but this but the, the 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 woman whose purse it was was um, she had been kind of like it, it sort of like in a it seemed like she was like in a poppy field she was like oh it's okay I have to have non-attachment it's okay all my things are ruined but you know what I can just let go of those things and the organizers are going yeah yeah it's really good to be unattached it's really it's really good that you have this level of spiritual awareness and I'm like who's wait somebody needs to be taking responsibility here and somebody needs to be holding someone responsible here and it's not all about letting go of it all and all being in nirvana right I mean and I think that um, you know I mean there's lots of different ways that that could be approached but that woman I could tell she was really really trying to um, she was she wasn't being honest with herself and she she wasn't she wasn't and the organizers were encouraging her not to be honest with herself about her feelings because they didn't want to have to deal with the consequences and they didn't want to have to take responsibility for the fact that this dog shouldn't have been there <laughs> and so um, you know it was uh, an interesting it's an interesting illustration of how people try to override strong emotion that they have rather than trying to understand where it's coming from and why and you know being able to work with something like anger um, to put down a boundary you know one of the big problems if you know anger of course is a big emotion that we all struggle with and if you don't let yourself feel it you can't understand what it's telling you about and one of the things that anger often will tell you about is how your boundaries have been violated so I mean there's all different kinds of relationships to anger and I'm gonna I think I'm going to be doing a webinar on that sometime soon. Um, but um, but anyway, so that's an example of trying to suppress one's own emotions and trying to get to that non-dual place. But the um, and so there's there's this kind of as they're trying to let go of their experience that they are rejecting that experience doesn't just go away it goes further into their psyche and um, that which is not healed bounces off the non-dual state and triggers a trauma reaction so that's the kind of spiritual emergency that can happen and that's what happened in this one case this was a Zen student and he was one of those people that thought you can't be angry you, you know if you're going to be a spiritual person you can't be angry and um, what happened was he took all of his anger and he separated himself but he projected it it's, it started getting projected onto the non-dual state that he was chasing and so every time he went into meditation all of this disowned experience started coming back at him and he started having this massive amount of paranoia 
he really felt like he was being attacked and he got agoraphobic um, you know had you know panic attacks couldn't breathe and um, you know was in a real state of agitation and that was actually just a function of all of his disowned you know churning emotion primarily anger at himself getting projected into the meditation practice and coming back on to him and so um, so how do you deal with that how do we deal with that so of course the first thing you always have with dealing with the spiritual emergency is compassionate holding you know to not judge not to judge him for having this misconception but then the next thing you have to do is you identify you have to identify what's generating the spiritual emergency and here it was a misconception about the nature of non-duality and the proper relationship to it and um, um, the um, so we have the compassionate holding and we have that fierce compassion trying to help him tease out with questions within depth hypnosis we have a process called insight inquiry which is basically interactive vipassana where you're always act, asking questions based on the last answer and so um, the uh, so we spent time looking looking at these misunderstandings about what it was to be a spiritual person and getting him to a place where he could allow himself to know that he had negative emotions and then um then the 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 biggest thing for him was um a sense of failure that he could not attain that non-dual state and that he had come into the spiritual crisis and he was very very much attacking himself and so of course one of the things that we had to help him do is um, rediscover his Buddha nature and help him reestablish a relationship with that part of himself that is already connected to that non-dual place the ground luminosity and then also with that stability be able to look at the places um, where the misconceptions had created difficulty in a compassionate way through that inquiry and basically help him return through doing this to his anger to allow you know that all of that creates the space for his anger to actually be present and to speak and to and we can make inquiry into the anger to see what its genesis was and within depth hypnosis we have some processes that are drawn from shamanic practice such as soul retrieval and there was a lot he had spent a lot of his youth in um, a pretty abusive situation and he had a good reason to be angry and so we did um, quite a few um, we did a lot of regression therapy back to those times and worked with soul retrieval processes to help him reclaim these parts of himself that had been that were angry and had a right to be angry and needed healing so um, and we were able to help him with that particular spiritual emergency and that that particular that was a really helpful you know that really helped him and he was able to kind of return to his practice with greater knowledge and the important thing to remember about all spiritual crisis and I know that some of you you know some many of you actually seem to have already know this well and you know already that this is a learning experience ultimately if you can come through it um, that and get the help that you need um, that it is a learning experience and it does teach you very important spiritual lessons and it does help you evolve spiritually you know these um, spiritual emergencies are not something to be you know like there's it, it, I mean it seems like something's wrong but actually the only thing that's wrong is that you you have you have <clears throat> kind of painted yourself into a corner and the encounter with the transcendent or the effort to encounter the transcendent is showing you how you've gotten yourself painted into a corner 
And how helpful is that? It was so helpful for him to be able to heal all that anger. It was wonderful. And so it's, you know, the important thing whenever approaching a spiritual emergency is to remember that there is going to be a teaching and a learning on the other side of it and through it. And, um, and that was the case in the next case study that I want to tell you about, which is a spiritual emergency as a result of... Um, uh, oh, they, I have another one. I have another case study on spiritual practice. I'll tell you that if we have time. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to go into the, um, to the one on plant medicine because I want to have time for everyone to be able to ask questions about their own situation if they want to. Um, and if, if nobody wants to, that's okay. Then we'll, I'll go back and give you that, that one too. I'll give you that, one, that case study. So this case study is... Um, this was a uh, experience uh, with salvia divinorum, actually. And um, we need to talk a little bit about plant medicines in general. Of course, um, you know, there has been this huge resurgence in uh, the ingestion of uh, hallucinogenic or psychotropic plants um, in the last 20 years or so. And... Um, the practice of imbibing psychotropic or, or hallucinogenic plants, of course, is part of many shamanic traditions. Not all shamanic traditions, but many shamanic traditions. And um, you have um, a wide variety of plants that provide a wide variety of experience. And... Um, the you know of course probably the most common or best known is the psilocybin mushroom um, there's also because it's so widespread it grows everywhere and you find it in a lot of different traditions and also it it is something that the scientific community has re has shown interest in again after having done everything they did in the 50s and 60s to to work with uh, hallucinogenics in a less than respectful way um, and now they are coming back with some respect for the spirits of these plants and they are finding for instance at Johns Hopkins how useful the uh, it is to work with psilocybin for people who are facing fatal diagnosis it really helps lessen the anxiety and the depression associated with that and of course, this is one of the reasons why a lot of people are m turning to plant medicines because they are feeling like they have kind of hit a wall with their practice. Some people are doing it recreationally and they're the ones that often wind up in my office with a spiritual emergency because they were not approaching the experience of the plant medicine with um, uh, respect and humility. And um, you also have, of course, ayahuasca, which has become an extremely widespread um, uh, um, tea, a hallucinogenic tea, that um, people have very powerful experiences with. The, the spirits of ayahuasca are very unflinching and very powerful in the kinds of insights that they reveal to people. And then, of course, you have plants like peyote, San Pedro cactus, all the mescaline containing cactuses. And, um, you know, one of the things that I find um, among Buddhist, uh, Buddhist communities is that, of course, within the Eightfold Path, there is this, this stricture uh, that you should not imbibe uh, mind-altering, you know, substances. And I totally get it. And um, yet, uh, you know, when it, and so people are afraid to go to their Buddhist teachers when they've done these plants to get help because they, they feel like they've violated a code of some kind. Well, you know, I mean, technically, you know, one of the things I love about Buddhism is that, you know, when you get technical, things can shift. And w one of the things that I think of, I mean, I'm also a shamanic teacher. I teach all levels of shamanic practice. So I have a particular relationship to plants that shamanic practitioners the world over have, not just hallucinogenic plants, but, but the medicinal, truly medicinal herbal plant, herbal medicine. Um, but for me, I, I always feel that 
you know, if you're imbibing a substance that's going to bring you closer to yourself, or you're doing it with that intentionality of trying to understand yourself, then this must be understood to be a spiritual practice worthy of investigation. But again, there is a context, a set, and a setting that must be observed. And we go deeply into this in the classes on plant, plant medicine integration and preparation classes at, at the Sacred Stream. But most, as I say, most people who have spiritual emergency coming out of plant medicine ceremonies haven't followed these, these guidelines. And um, they find themselves um, at the mercy of these unflinching spiritual teachers who the plants are. And um, so, uh, and they don't know, have any idea how to integrate what has happened. And they go to their Buddhist practice and they're, you know, they, they feel hesitant to, um, to talk about it. But again, you know, the thing to remember is that, um, you know, if, if, you, if, if, you, if you, even after the fact, you can begin to look at your experience of a spiritual emergency that emerges out of a plant medicine as a spiritual quest. And so, um, you know, plant, the plant reveals aspects of personal experience that people may have forgotten about, that they may have repressed, or they may have suppressed. And so these aspects of the self are up, and that's what's driving the crisis. And, um, and the other thing that the plants tend to do is they tend to reveal different types of experiences that are outside the norm of known reality. And that can be very disturbing for people as they try to integrate these larger realities. And um, there can be this sense of loss of self in the context of a larger transcendent reality. And that people can't place themselves, they can't find themselves in that larger reality and that larger transcendent reality is so much larger than anything they might have ever imagined and that makes them feel that they have lost they, they start to lose meaning like what is life you know who am i am i nothing is what is this is this nothing what i thought it was and i think a lot of us are having that particular experience right now without plants <laughs> and i know it's not funny but um but, but that is what is happening. We're having this larger confrontation with the larger forces of nature. And um, it is bringing up a lot of the different aspects of ourselves that we haven't fully understood. And um, unfortunately, a lot of those aspects of the self, especially um, perhaps and those around us, uh, ha they need healing. These are, these are aspects of the self that need healing. And, um, and, you know, when people go into plant medicine, everyone needs healing. There's no one that doesn't need healing. You know, there's, there's always another layer of, of subtle experience. Even if you've done a lot of work, there's always going to be a layer of, le of more subtle experience that the plants are going to reveal. And so, um, and so, you know, so people go into the plants experience integration process going back to try to reclaim and understand these parts of the self that have been revealed to them without them actually expecting that to happen. And part of the integration process, of course, is integrating the self within this larger transcendent reality. And again, you do this of course, again, you know, starting with Buddha nature, you know, but for a different reason. Because within Buddha nature, you know, you're looking, in the first instance, we were looking at, you know, this part of the self that is not angry, that is stable and connected to the ground luminosity. That's why we were looking at Buddha nature. But here we're looking at Buddha nature because it is connected to the ground luminosity. This is an essential aspect of the person. This is who you are. So rest in that. It's, it, you know, like you're not separate from that. That is within you. And you can come to terms with it in this new way, in the way that the plant has shown you. And that was what we had, that's what we did when we did in this case study with the salvia divinorum. So I don't know if you know about how salvia divinorum works, but 
uh, it's a sage and all sages have this quality to them where they erase energetic patterns that if you if you use the aromatic oils or if you um, particularly if you burn the plant the dried plant <clears throat> especially certain species it will erase energetic imprints it will erase energetic patterns and this is one of the reasons why the Plains Indians of North America for instance would always burn a person's belongings after they had died um, uh, with salvia with with the uh, white sage to keep the um, person who had died from finding their way back to the earth because they wanted to help them continue on into the, the on the red road in, on their own on their own path so um, so this is the nature of salvia in general all, all, uh, all the sages that I've ever worked with have this kind of quality to them and so one of the problems with salvia divinorum of course is that now people are taking greater and greater concentrations of that aromatic oil and they are taking tinctures of it and um, that is having the effect of literally erasing a person's pathway to themselves. I've had lots of people that I've worked with with this problem and um, they can't find the self. They can, they can no longer find who they are. I, I remember I w worked with one guy who said that he, in, he was smoking salvia and when he went to inhale he couldn't find his mouth and he became you know panicked of course and so um, so so again there's this return to the Buddha nature reminding yes you do have this connection to the ground luminosity but then the thing that I have found to be most helpful with, for people who have this kind of dissolution of self or the inability to find self um, as a result of a plant medicine encounter is um, the reconstruction of the self through deity meditation and um, so deity meditation I'm sure many of you know this is a process of merging with the field of a deity and generally speaking in general practice so one of the deities, you know, so particularly in Tibetan Buddhism, you have this pantheon of, of, of different forms of deities that are expressions of the awakened mind of the Buddha. So you, you have, you know, you have, you have, for instance, I don't know if you can see behind me, I have, I have Medicine Buddha, who is the, the healing Buddha behind me. Um, and, um, you know, of course, this would be the ideal Buddha to work with um, in the deity meditation because all of Tibetan medicine, for instance, emerges out of this field of the, of the, the deity, of the medicine Buddha. And the whole field, it's a lapis field, lapis blue, lapis lazuli, is a healing field. So the way that we would, the way you work with deity meditation, of course, is you have to do what we did at the beginning of class where you settle your mind and then, um, then you work with the image of the deity and uh, you do a series of visualizations and processes of merging your own energy field with that of the deity. And from this perspective when you know for generally speaking people who are doing deity meditation processes as part of their spiritual practice what they're trying to do is expand their capacity to hold um, power or to hold understanding or awareness by entering into the field of the deity um, but in this case with with plant medicine when people have lost themselves it's the opposite they you use the deity meditation to give the person a sense of consolidation a sense of of being able to hold together within the field of the deity and so that was what we did we did meditations to do that and we helped bring him back from that spiritual emergency and um, then of course 
there's more work to do, again, with insight inquiry, that interactive vipassana process of helping the person establish themselves in ordinary reality once that consolidation in non-ordinary reality is done. So, um, that's, we're going to go one more and then we're going to take questions and then um, see if people have anything they need help with. So, um, the third type of spiritual emergency that we're going to be looking at tonight is the resurgence of unbidden and unaddressed trauma, both within practice and outside of practice. So um, I, we're, we're going to look at one that is uh, within practice. Um, so this is about, um, well, actually, this particular case um, was both um, this, the experiences that she was having as she sat down to meditate were experiences that she was having walking down the street, too. They just became much louder. Um, and so she, she was just having a lot of anxiety and um, a, just a tremendous, you know, like unable to settle. And so that was actually why she had started trying to do Buddhist meditation. It was because she was looking for something to settle her mind. But what happened was as soon as she sat down, everything became more intense which is often what will happen. Um, and because, you know, the, uh, you know, a lot of our activities, as many of you have noticed, especially as we've been unable to distract ourselves in all the ways that we often do during this time of the virus, um, uh, you know, when you're left with yourself, you know, that can be tough if you haven't had the help that you need to really look at the underlying roots of why you've been distracting yourself then you're left with all the reasons of why you're distracting yourself. And so when people sit down to meditate, they really will often have this emergence of these things that they've been distracted from. And so she was having anxiety attacks on the street, but they were getting really bad in, in, the, in the zendo. And... Um, um, so... One of the things that happened here with the anxiety is that we did a depth hypnosis process, which is um, a process of actually following in the anxiety. It's not different than, for instance, in Vipassana meditation, when you focus in on something, you know, you settle your mind, and then you take your focus and you start exploring a particular part of the body or a particular mind state and you allow information to emerge from that meditative focus. And um, we have an interactive process of that in depth hypnosis, which is where you're helping a person move into an altered state, which rather than be meditation, is a hypnotherapeutic state. It, they're both altered states, but you just get in in different ways. With um, meditation, you're self-mediated, moving into the altered state, and with hypnotherapy, you're other mediated. Someone helps you move into the altered state. And so um, we, what we do in depth hypnosis is we actually follow the presenting symptom um, whenever it's a, you know, if it's anxiety or depression or hatred or revenge, we, we follow that in. We actually illuminate that internally in order to try to find out what the roots of it are. So, again, this is a, you know, you know, it's understood that everything that's manifesting has its roots in something. Nothing, nothing, you'll hear me say a thousand times in the depth hypnosis trainings, um, nothing happens in a vacuum. So, you, you know, and that's important to remember with the spiritual emergency, is that there is something within the self that is driving this. And um, it is simply a matter of discovering it. And that's why, again, I want to say for people who are experiencing spiritual emergency or if you're trying to help someone with spiritual emergency, the thing that you want to always remember is that everything is workable. Everything is healable. There is a path through. And often the path through is actually path 
the path through. You have to go into it. And this is where that Buddhist concept of personal responsibility is so important. Because everything is workable if you can take responsibility for your experience. And, um, and, and, you know, one's saying, you know, you know, to be blamed for your experience. And often people don't want to take responsibility because they think it's about blame. But it really is just about, um, about taking responsibility, recognizing that you, this is your experience. Whatever it is, it's yours. You're having it. And it's a matter of trying to understand its roots. And so in depth hypnosis, we have this hypnotherapeutic process where we go through. Um, and um, that's what we did with the anxiety. And the thing that we found was, unfortunately, um, that that anxiety, those anxiety attacks that she had been having, that had been breaking through, and that became, uh, as she was walking down the street, and that became very elevated as she sat down on the cushion, was... Um, it led her to a time where she was being molested um, as a young child by a sibling, and she had completely repressed it. So, um, and uh, that you know, unfortunately, that happened over time, and it continued into the way that she related to people sexually. She often found found herself feeling vic victimized by her partners. So, and she has all this, you know, had all this anxiety around that, and then anxiety around connecting with people, anxiety around connecting with herself, or anxiety around connecting with anything that was arising out of this suppressed experience of having been connected with in this really harmful way. So, um, we were able to, um, with depth hypnosis, again, we have some shamanic processes and some energy medicine processes that we worked with to help her to help take her out of those situations that she was still caught in. In in shamanism, there's this understanding that uh, again, when there's a soul loss due to trauma, soul loss is a, a loss of a part of the self that the part of the self leaves the self due to trauma, and it will stay often stay near that traumatic event and not come back, but it will telegraph information from that traumatic event, and that's why you have post-traumatic stress from a, from, a Buddhist, from a shamanic point of view. So we were doing, again, soul retrievals, helping her in a compassionate way, bringing complete compassion to her experience. She had a lot of self-judgment, lots of compassionate holding, and um, helping her you know, take responsibility that this is her experience, helping, holding her kindly through that and, you know, so that she didn't have to disown that anymore. And then um, one of the things that we worked with there um, was uh, a meditation that you may have heard about is the jewel tree meditation. Um, it, you know, the, in Tibetan Buddhist practice, there's this concept of the jewel tree and the jewel net um, and that um, there is this bringing forward of, um, of, of this uh, luminescence from the jewels to help feed the spirit. And we worked with those practices too. So, um, and she, she came out of it. I mean, again, you know, the wonderful thing about spiritual emergency is that although it's very difficult, it ultimately, when you know how to work with it and when a person can, can have access to these tools um, uh, from Buddhist practice, um, and you know, again, from depth hypnosis with shamanic, pract shamanic work and energy medicine work too, that, um, that people can heal. And so you can see how the Four Noble Truths have been uh, you know, very important in uh, understanding these different cases. You see how compassionate holding and fierce compassion is helpful. You see how, um, how the understanding of Buddha nature and, um, the under and the understanding of personal responsibility are all part of how we approached each of these spiritual emergencies. And of course, the thing we have to remember is that, you know, whatever is emerging is part of our, our, 
our, karm, our karmic response or our, our karmic pattern. And the way that we respond is also showing us part of our karmic patterns. And so, so very important to, you know, be, how wonderful to be able to actually see a karmic pattern and then to be able to work with it, to dismantle it. So, because most of us are, are being driven around by our karma in a way that we don't fully understand. And one of the great things is about the spiritual emergency when it's handled properly is that one can understand how to work with what is being presented or one can understand that something, the things that are being presented in the spiritual emergency are something to be worked with. So, um, and that, that in and of itself is stabilizing and provides meaning and focus and balance. So, um, that's my lecture for this evening. I can go back and give you that other case study if we need to, but I thought I would uh, just take some time to ask some, or to answer some questions. Maybe I'll be asking some too. And, um, and see if anyone has anything that they need some help with that I might be able to help with. Any questions? Yes, I, I, have, a, I have a question, Lisa. This is okay. Kind of okay. Um, and uh, I'm interested in. Um, in, in the practice of meditation for, uh, well, and there's a lot to it, but specifically what I'm doing is I'm, I'm looking to like lose self to basically to, to, to meld in with my environment, to dissolve myself a little bit. This is an experience I've touched upon and it's, it's, it's really, um, it's really uh, wonderful for me. I like, I, I, I enjoy it. And, um, I, uh, you know, the idea of uh, doing plant medicines to facilitate that is interesting, but I'm, I'm curious, do you feel that just with, with simply a meditation practice can one achieve the same goals as people who are using plant medicines? Sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, the thing about plant medicines is that they, the reason that a lot of people do them is because they remove internal obstacles to the self very quickly <laughs> and sometimes too quickly which is what generates the emergency but they do they 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 break down internal they break one of the one of the goals of spiritual practice and it's particularly a meditation practice is to break down internal barriers to reality as you're saying you're trying to dissolve into the environment so to kind of like break down those separations that you have between you and the environment. By the way, just to, uh, I'm sure you figured this out, you've got to be careful what environment you're dissolving into, right? Don't just dissolve into any environment. Um, so, um, especially right now, you have to like really have a good container of clear space um, that you're working with. Um, so, um, but I'm sure you figured that out already. But, um, but, um, the thing about plant medicines is that they will facilitate that breaking down between self, the, the, between the inner barriers of the self. And, and so, but that is something that is the whole goal of spiritual practice, right? It's the whole goal of meditative practice. So it may just take a little bit longer, but you'll definitely get there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, just real quick. Um, this is Ken. I know you said in the past teaching at the Sacred Stream, you, you've said more than once that um, depth hypnosis is the plant medicine experience slowed down. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I would kind of agree with that, um, that, that sentiment. Um, uh -huh. yeah. You know, yeah, meditation is quite powerful, Matt, I'm sure, as you, as you know. And, um, and then if you get an opportunity to take any of Issa's classes, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just a student. Um, they're, they're really wonderful, and there's a lot of different introductory ones. You don't have to jump into being a depth hypnosis practitioner or a shamanic counselor or any of that. You can, you can, you can kind of nibble and bite at the tree at the, at the what do you call it, the low-hanging fruits or something. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. That's so nice of you. Thank you. Actually, we do have um, a class in Applied Buddhist Psychology coming up. I think Noam probably put the link in. 
um, it's, it's called Entering the Stream. And it's basically looking at the way in which um, taking refuge affects your psychological orientation. And um, it's, you know, we kind of look at taking refuge in the three jewels in a kind of new perspective, maybe, hopefully. Um, and, um, and then we also have, uh, you know, a lot of other, we have relationships and karma coming up, uh, ever favorite uh, class. Um, while we're speaking in a Buddha, it's a, it's, it's a class about how, rela- it's a class about understanding relationships from a Buddhist point of view, a karmic point of view. So there's a lot, there's a lot going on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ken, for mentioning that. Anyone else have any questions? Hi, um, Kara here. I was wondering if you could um, speak more about um, the taking self-responsibility and that kind of process and what that looks and feels like i guess sure um and it's a, it's an i'm glad you asked that question because it's something that people you know can get confused about in my book coming to peace i spend a lot of time talking about the difference between personal responsibility and blame and the wonderful thing about personal responsibility is that if you can take responsibility for your response to things, for you know your experience of things, um, then you have control over it. If you don't take responsibility, you can't change it. And so that's the really like wonderful thing to remember when you're thinking about personal responsibility. It's like, if you're trying to pretend this didn't happen, this didn't happen, I didn't do this, this, I wasn't, I didn't, you know, I wasn't there. You know, if you're trying to like get away from a, a difficult experience, then you have, um, you don't have a way to change it. You don't have a way to change your relationship to it. All you have is this kind of one trick pony of trying to deny or separate from it, which you can't do. <laughs> you have to integrate. The psyche will not allow you to not integrate, <laughs> right? So. Uh, because you have all these symptoms that come up if you if you try to so and then so in terms of blame you know there's no reason to be harsh or to punish yourself for anything that has ever happened to you or any way in which you've ever responded again this is where that buddhist understanding of compassion is so important and Um, so again, you know, if you were to take responsibility for, let's say, being angry or something like that, then you can change it. And then if you can hold yourself compassionately for being angry and understand why you were being angry and have compassion for those reasons, then, you know, you've got, you've got something that's workable. But if you turn around and you say, there's, you know, I can't tell you how many people I have worked with over the years that are angry, for instance, they're angry at themselves for being angry, right? And that compounds their experience. And so that's a kind of self-blame. And there's nowhere to go with that. So this is where you need that field of compassion opening up. So I hope that addresses your question. If it doesn't, ask me another one. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Any other questions? I have a question. Okay. Um, Thank you for doing all of this again, by the way. You're so welcome. Um, Thank you for being here. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yes. Um, What's a good way to kind of get at the core of the an issue that you're not, you see so many, I, I have an issue that I'm starting to work on and it's overwhelming. I'm like aware, where does, where is the core of it? Where is, you know, there are just so many, and, and of course it's always icky, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> right. So I've spent time just trying to go through like a bio of, of years, kind of trying to, and I, I'm, um, any ideas? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that's a very good start going, taking a biography of the issue. That's okay. a really good start. And before you start with that, it may be helpful because, you know, one of the things that you'll always hear me say is that the reason that we cannot or feel like we cannot heal is because we don't have enough power. And that's a shamanic term, but, you know, it's also a Buddhist term in terms of compassion. Compassion is a form of power, right? And so in depth hypnosis, for instance, the, one of the first things that we do is we help people connect with a source of power within them. And of course, within the Buddhist context, that's Buddha nature, right? So you might want to spend some time doing that shamatha meditation that we did at the beginning and asking to really understand your Buddha nature and remembering that Buddha nature is that part of yourself that is compassionate, that is wise, that is connected to the ground luminosity in an unbroken way. And, and to really develop a relationship with your Buddha nature there, because that's a form of power, like getting in touch with your power. Because one of the things that happens when you hit these big patterns of imbalance is that, that you feel overwhelmed because you feel like that's all there is of you. You know, you feel like, you know, like when you're in it, you feel like there's nothing else of me. Like I'm just this totally imbalanced thing. But if you have this anchor of this connection to power within you here through the, you know, the, in depth hypnosis, we have a, a process that we do that's a hypnotherapeutic process that, is, that helps you connect. But you can do this with your own meditative practice. And so just connect with your Buddha nature. Really spend time like every day, like feeling the support of it, feeling the compassion of it. And it will open up as you do your shamatha meditation. If you look for it, there'll be that spaciousness that, and you know, just keep asking to be shown that. And so that should help you with the, over, with, help you with the overwhelm. Of course, it's always a good idea to work with someone else when you're feeling really overwhelmed. And you know, this is why I really like depth hypnosis. I mean, there's a million reasons why I like it, but one of the reasons I like it is because the practitioner's practice becomes the floor for the person who's looking to get help. Because it's often when you're in the middle of a whole bunch of patterns, it's hard to remember that floor. It's hard to remember your Buddha nature and you have the practitioner there holding you, helping you. Um, so those are two things, but then doing your bio, like, like some questions that you could ask. Okay. So like, just a ask, you can journal this and you can say like, what are all the places where this pattern has been active in my life? What are all the relationships where this pattern has been active? And then what effect did that pattern have on me in these situations and in these relationships? and then sit with the effect. And then if you're going to work in a Buddhist way, in a, with Buddhist meditation, then what you'd want to do is, you, you know, it depends on what it is. So um, if the effect is, um, let's say self, let's say it, the, the effect of the pattern is to help, to makes you dislike yourself then you can do a loving kindness meditation towards yourself, right? Um, so, and then, you know, if it's, um, if the issue is, um, let's say, um, let's say the issue is uh, denial, like that you've been in denial, like you're, the effect of this has made you go into denial about all kinds of things, then again, you bring that, you know, you can work with the deity, like for instance, Chen Rezik or Avalokiteshvara, and just ask, you know, do, do you know, to, to meditate in the presence of that deity and ask for help loosening that denial, you know. So these are ways to work. In depth hypnosis, we would work a, a little bit differently, but I'm trying to stay within the Buddhist context. Um, but um, 
if you, you know, am I helping you here? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I'm just listening. Yes. Great. Okay. Yeah. And also, also, um, pay attention to your dreams because yeah. your, your dreams, I'm sure you may have already discovered, will deliver for you in terms of insights and, and you know, further places to go. Yeah, and the journeys are, are helping as well. And yeah, that's great. Oh, great. So if you're doing the journey practice, well, of course, you know, I'm a big journeyer. <laughs> I, I try to stay in the, in the Buddhist context here, but, you know, working with a guide is really a great way to go. Yeah. Thank you. Thank sure, you. sure. If you have a particular issue that you, you like, if you want it, if you have a particular point that you want me to look at, let me know. I don't know how much you want to reveal about yourself, but you know, if there's a particular point, let me know. Um, but it's actually we're getting toward time. So, um, any last question? Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone at San Francisco Dharma Collective. Noam, I know how hard you work. And, you know, I so appreciate all the work that you all do in the world. And I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to support your work and um, to participate. And I thank you for the invitation. And I'll be happy to come back anytime if you're going to do these wise action uh, meditations and lectures on an ongoing basis I'm always happy to support and um, always happy to be in circle with all of you and thank you all so much for being here and um, I look forward to being in circle with you again soon let's go ahead and close circle for the evening the Sun is a circle the moon is a circle the earth is a circle The drum is a circle. We are a circle within a circle. All right, everyone. Blessings.